Good. Welcome everybody to this first series of two webinars on obesity in the renal transplant candidate. I am Daniel Abramovics, a transplant physician from Belgium, and I will moderate this session. Our patients are not spared from the global pandemic of obesity, and this poses specific surgical and medical challenges to the transplant teams. Realizing that there was an unmet need for an in-depth review of the literature and guideline on this topic, Descartes, the transplantation working group of ERA, decided to set up a working group together with the former European Best Practice Advisory Board of ERA. This group included Gabi Oniscu and Stephen O'Neill, both transplant surgeons from the UK, Umberto Maggiore and Ilaria Gandolfini, nephrologists from Italy, Mehmet Sukur from Turkey, Rachel Hellemann from Belgium, three nephrologists with methodology knowledge from the former ERBP, Davide Bolignano from Italy, Jonut Nistor from Romania, and Evi Nagler from Belgium, and myself. The guideline entitled Management of Obesity in Kidney Transplant Candidate and Recipients has been recently published online on the website of the NDT. You have also already received the link to access the document. Today, Dr. Ilaria Gandolfini and Stephen O'Neill will present you the content of the guideline. You may ask your questions through the program and I will dispatch them to our speaker or our distinguished panelists, Dr. Umberto Maggiore and Dr. Jonut Nistor. A second webinar focused on a series of interactive clinical cases will follow within some months. So now I give the word to our first speaker, Stephen O'Neill. Stephen, you have the floor. Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm Stephen O'Neill and I'm a consultant transplant surgeon in the Belfast City Hospital. My only relevant disclosure is that I'm the co-chair of the British Transplant Society guideline on DCD transplantation, but there isn't much overlap between that particular guideline and the guideline that we're discussing today. The first thing to say from a surgical perspective is that the obese uh, kidney transplant recipients can represent quite a technical challenge in terms of depth of access and distance from the iliac vessels. This is a transplant recipient who was transplanted by my colleague in Belfast, Tim Brown. Uh, the recipient had a BMI of 40. And you can see from the images and the corresponding CT that the access for vascular anastomoses was really quite deep at around 17 centimeters. But sending patients away to lose weight is not without its own problems. In addition to potentially increasing time on dialysis, any weight loss may just be the result of fluid loss or sarcopenia and could leave excess skin that leads to wound healing issues. This patient was also transplanted in Belfast around one week after this photo was taken and the recipient had decreased their BMI from 60 to 45 in the lead up to transplant. The first clinical question I'll address in the guideline is what measure best reflects obesity as a risk factor for kidney transplantation in patients with end stage kidney disease? The background to this question is that BMI is the most widely used metric. BMI is pretty simple to calculate. It defines obesity in a simple way and breaks up obesity into easy to remember classes. But there are limitations to BMI since it may not differentiate well between muscle and fat or indeed peripheral versus visceral fat. Visceral fat is considered more problematic in terms of poor health outcomes. 
Ideally, we would like to know how much visceral fat an individual has, and there are surrogate measures that could help determine this. These include waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, and conicity index, which is calculated using a formula involving waist circumference, weight, and height. The systematic search for evidence in this area identified five studies from a total of nearly 3,000 citations. In dialysis populations, two prospective studies were identified. One study reported waist to hip ratio and waist circumference as better predictors of mortality than BMI. The other reported higher conicity index and higher waist circumference to be associated with mortality, but did not make a comparison with BMI. In the transplant population, three studies were identified that looked at different outcomes in mortality, new onset cardiovascular disease, and surgical complications. In one of these studies, waist circumference was reported to be more predictive of mortality than BMI. In terms of translating this evidence into a statement, we identified only two studies that compared BMI with other measures. In these studies, the alternative measures of waist circumference and waist to hip ratio were reported to be better at identifying mortality than BMI, but there were limitations to the studies, including an assumption of a linear relationship between BMI and outcome and the potential for bias. So it is difficult to be sure whether the other measures are truly characteristic of greater risk or whether this is analytical artifact. As such, we give a level 2C suggestion of measuring waist circumference or waist to hip ratio in addition to BMI. The next clinical question was what degree of obesity by level of BMI influences the outcomes in kidney transplant recipients? The background to this question is that obesity can increase surgical complications. In our experience in Belfast, for example, some degree of Wound morbidity is almost guaranteed in class three obesity, particularly if there is associated risk factors like diabetic nephropathy. There's also literature to suggest potentially worse outcomes following transplantation of obese recipients, but equally literature to suggest survival benefit in comparison to dialysis. Finally, there's no firm consensus on whether BMI restrictions should be in place for transplant candidates. The systematic search for evidence in this area identified 34 studies from a total of over 3,000 citations. There were a total of eight systematic reviews and meta-analyses. For most articles, BMI was categorically broken up into 30 and over for obese transplant recipients, and outcomes were compared with recipients with a BMI less than 30. Data for higher BMI recipients was not separately analyzed, and not every review separately analyzed outcomes that were adjusted for confounding factors. In addition to reviews, there were 26 separate observational studies, 13 of which adjusted for outcomes uh, based on confounding factors other than BMI. What we found was that in the BMI 30 to 34 range, the risk of death or graft loss may not actually be higher. However, there are relatively consistent reports of an increase in various other complications, such as delayed graft function, rejection, post-transplant diabetes, and wound morbidity. Most clinicians and patients would accept these risks, but informed decision-making with potential recipients is obviously crucial when taking on this additional risk. For higher BMIs, complications were more likely, but the data was sparse. As such, it was difficult to make recommendations on the data identified. The following statements were therefore made. We suggest accepting people with end-stage kidney disease and a BMI of 30 to 34 for kidney transplantation, if otherwise suitable but there are insufficient data to make a recommendation in the higher BMI categories. 
and we recommend counseling on the possible increased risk of delayed graft function, wound-related morbidity, acute rejection, and diabetes after transplantation. I'll just hand over to Alaria there for the next parts of the guideline. All right. So I will move to chapter three and four of this guideline. These are my disclosures. And so uh, the third question is, does obesity influence the benefit harm balance of kidney transplantation versus dialysis in people otherwise considered suitable for transplantation? So we, Sorry. Okay, so we um, learned from chapter two that obese patients at an increased risk of delayed graft function, acute rejection, post-transplant diabetes mellitus and one complication com when compared to non-obese patients. And we have not sufficient data for BMI greater than 34. But how about the benefit of transplanting these patients comparing uh, keeping them on uh, dialysis? So we will focus on patient survival benefits and the perioperative mortality. So from the National Registry uh, from the UK and the US, we can found a, a survival benefit at one year in uh, patients with a BMI less than 40, with a, a, the greater ben the survival benefit in living donation and the least in the extended criteria donor. And also in UK, they found a survival benefit at five years of 20% uh, of average in all BMI categories. The data are less clear in Europe because we have a lower mortality on dialysis and we have few data. Uh, so what about the uh, benefit versus dialysis in BMI greater, equal or greater than 40? Uh, from the US data, we still have a benefit, even if it is lower compared to BMI lower than 40. And again, in the UK, survival benefit uh, persists even with BMI greater than 39, even if we have limited data. And from a US study, uh, quite big, uh, there is a reduction in the long-term heart failure, even in patients with uh, BMI greater than 40. What about perioperative mortality after transplant? There is an excess mortality early after transplant in obese versus non-obese patient, uh, especially in extended criteria donation. Uh, for example, using standard criteria donation, we can find that the number of days with early increased mortality after transplant, that is normally 100, can rise up to 245 for very obese patients. So let's translate this data into evidence. The best current evidence comes from the large national registry studies with moderate bias. First of all, because of limited number of obese patients with a BMI greater than 40 and the extrapolation of dialysis survival from the US. This data suggests that obese patients derive a significant benefit from transplantation as compared on, to remain on, on dialysis. And uh, furthermore, the survival benefit appears to be sustained for all BMI grades, but there is a, at different levels. And there is some evidence that transplantation decreases the risk of long-term cardiovascular events, also in these patients. So we suggest timely listing and transplant these people. So let's come to the recommendation uh, from the ERDTA working group. Does obesity influence the benefit harm balance of kidney transplantation versus dialysis in people otherwise considered suitable for transplantation? We suggest that kidney transplantation either from a disease or living donor is the optimal treatment for people with BMI 30 to 39.9 and end-stage kidney disease, who otherwise are, suit, are considerable suitable for tra kidney transplantation. We suggest not delaying weight listing or transplantation solely on the basis of the unincreased BMI in people with a BMI 30 to 39 and end-stage kidney disease who are otherwise suitable for transplantation. So now let's move to what are the benefits and harms of interventions aim at weight loss in kidney transplant candidates with end-stage kinesis. 
We know that obese patients on dialysis have a lower survival rate versus transplant irrespective of BMI. However, kidney transplant candidates are often asked to lose weight before weight, uh, being weight listed, and only 10% lose any weight and only 5% reach the target uh, ideal um, BMI less than 30. Uh, moreover, healthy regimen are not always easy to follow on dialysis because fresh fruits and vegetables are rich in potassium and dairy products are, and meat are rich in phosphorus. So new treatments such as early start and minimal invasive uh, bariatric surgery technique can be an option. Uh, we found no randomized control trial on in obese patient transplant candidates uh, comparing different pre and transplant uh, weight management interventions. We found only eight non-randomized comparative studies plus a lot of case series. Most of the studies have a high risk of confounding bias and they are not powered to detect major clinical outcomes after transplant, like patient and graft survival. Orlistat is a, a local acting uh, gastrointestinal lipase inhibitor that reduces the absorption of the dietary fat and it is has a modest effect in CKD when used alone. However, it has been proposed in combination with supervised low fat diet and exercise program. Uh, however, unabsorbed fat can combine with calcium, leading also to an increased free oxalate reabsorption with an increased risk of nephrocalcinosis and graft loss. And moreover, uh, this drug can interfere, can have a drug interaction with the uh, uh, immune suppressive agents, in, in, in particular with cyclosporine. So let's move to the uh, program. Uh, the first one is the multidisciplinary weight management program in which low fat diet, uh, kidney specific low fat diet, uh, was combined with individual exercise program and Orlistat 120 milligram three times per day for two years and compared with standard of care. Um, the results, uh, we have an average weight loss of six kilograms at six months sustained for two years and a temporary improvement in exercise performance systolic blood pressure. However, this effect was lost at 12 and 24 months. They found no effect on mortality, major cardiovascular events, and likelihood of being waitlisted at six years. And moreover, they did, do not report any um, adverse effects, uh, for example, hyperoxaluria or drug drug interaction. So what do we know about bariatric surgery in the general population? The indication to, for bariatric surgery in the general population are BMI greater than 40, or 35 to 39 with at least one major comorbidity related to obesity, like uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and heart disease. And this, uh, the bariatric surgery can be divided into malabsorptive, uh, uh, restrictive, or mixed technique with a variable weight loss at one year uh, after surgery in the general population. But what do we know? about malabsorptive uh, bariatric surgery. It is a bypass of a segment of a small intestine inducing, reducing the number of calories and the amount of nutrient absorbed by the body. The techniques are generally biliopancreatic diversion with or without duodenal pouch. However, they are rarely performed for high rates of complication and we do not have much data on kidney transplant candidates for this reason. Restrictive bariatric surgery are mo the most common surgery used in these patients, and uh, the, um, uh, they are uh, reducing the size of the stomach, thereby limiting the amount of food that can be eaten by the patient. And we can have the gastric balloon, in which we don't, know, we don't have a, a lot of comparative, we do not have any comparative studies the gastric banding in which we do not have uh, comparative studies, but we have few case series on nine kidney um, transplant candidates uh, with a defective weight loss of 23%, but we have no other data. Let's come to the main restrictive bariatric surgery in this patient, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. We found three comparative studies 
And uh, we found actually a BMI reduction of seven point, uh, to nine points of BMR in this patient uh, at six uh, to 12 months. Uh, they found uh, an excess weight loss of 38% at six months. And this weight loss was also um, uh, connected to a reduced hypertension and pre-transplant diabetes rate. Uh, on the post-transplant outcome, they found a 15% reduction in delay graph function and also a reduction in the graph failure requiring hospitalization. One, found, one study found a zero incidence of post-transplant diabetes mellitus after transplant and 100% patient and graph survival at one year. However, another study found no difference in patient survival and 30-day readmission rate and acute rejection. Among the 17 case series, we found again a, a reduction in BMI, uh, six to 17 points. And uh, we um, report, they report one death for mediastinitis within 21 days after surgery. Overall death pr uh, prior to transplantation was 33%. Uh, for cardiovascular events and septic shock. However, uh, 13 um, patients died more than three months post-surgery. There is also a mixed bariatric surgery that combines uh, restriction with malabsorption, like the ron y gastric bypass. And what do we know from the data we collected uh, for these uh, guidelines? We found two retrospective cohort study at the time of transplantation, 210 patients. And they found no benefit in patient and graph survival. Actually, they reported a 30% higher risk of biopsy proven acute rejection. And uh, uh, we found also 10 case series investigating 305 ruan y gastric bypass, among other surgical technique. And there is a reduction four to 17 points of BMI and uh, uh, a, a trans, uh, the increase in, transplant, uh, in transplantation rate. Again, we found no data on mortality after one way gastric bypass. Actually, we have a 1.5 mortality within 45 days in the series with uh, a multiple surgery, including one way gastric bypass. However, we do not um, distinguish among the techniques. And was study reported a 5% oxalate nephropathy with half of them leading to a graft loss. Major complication was found in 7% of this patient. So let's translate into evidence. Multidisciplinary programs plus or minus early start are associated with a significant weight loss, however, with unclear effect on clinical outcomes. It is difficult, however, not to suggest a supervised program that is based on healthy nutrition and increased exercise. Bariatric surgery can be an option for effective weight loss and fewer obesity-related post-transplant complications. However, we do not have comparative outcome data before and after transplantation. The benefits, which increases when there is a larger BMI and weight, need to be balanced against the inevitable risk of perioperative complication and rare fatal events, even if we do not have clear data in immune suppressed patients. And uh, we should assess the risk and benefit of prolonging time to wait listing on a case by case basis. L uh, laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy can be preferred on one y gastric bypass because uh, it has no effect on drug and oxalate absorption. So to conclude, the recommendation for chapter four, what are the benefits and harms of investigations aimed at weight loss in kidney transplant candidates with end-stage kidney disease? We recommend encouraging kidney transplant candidates living with obesity to lose weight and having their nutritional status supervised by the multidisciplinary weight management team, 1D. We suggest considering bariatric surgery in kidney transplant candidates with BMI greater or equal than 40 to C, 
We suggest considering bariatric surgery in kidney transplant candidates with BMI greater or equal than 35, with at least one major obesity-related condition that can be improved by weight loss, 2D. And we suggest laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy uh, over other forms of bariatric surgery in kidney transplant candidate, 2D. Okay, I'm done. It's your turn, Stephen. So the next and final clinical question was what are the benefits and harms of bariatric surgery performed after kidney transplantation? The background to this question is that obesity is common in transplant recipients, and typically recipients will gain weight post-transplant. Bariatric surgery is an effective means of decreasing excess body weight, and the overall mortality rate after bariatric surgery is less than 1%. The risks of bariatric surgery include infection and anastomotic leaks, which are likely to be more common in patients receiving immunosuppression. There may also be additional risks associated with malabsorptive procedures, such as reduced absorption of immunosuppression and formation of kidney stones. The systematic search for evidence here identified 14 studies from a total of over 800 citations. In terms of comparative data, one retrospective cohort study reported similar weight loss when bariatric surgery was performed post-transplantation versus pre-transplant. Uh, other outcomes were not assessed between the two groups. The post-transplant group, when compared to match controls who were transplant recipients with no bariatric surgery, had a reduced risk of both mortality and graft loss. There was one early graft loss in the bariatric surgery group. In a smaller series of sleeve gastrectomy, weight loss was similar to non-transplant patients having the same procedure. The largest historic series of gastric bypass in transplant recipients with mainly open surgery had an average decrease in BMI from 47 to 40, but a 8% mortality rate. In four other more recent series, there was just one reported mortality across 24 patients, and again, significant weight loss. Across five other small case series publications of sleeve gastrectomy post kidney transplantation, there was effective weight loss, and reported complications in these series included the need for revisional surgery and readmissions of dehydration. There were isolated reports of bleeding excessive weight loss and pancreatitis. Data on gastric banding was sparse and limited to just a couple of cases within a wider case series describing this procedure in patients on chronic steroids. In terms of translating this evidence into statements, uh, there is limited low level evidence to suggest feasibility of bariatric surgery post kidney transplantation Short-term outcomes appear good, certainly in terms of weight loss. Longer-term outcomes are currently unknown. There appears to be potential advantages to sleep gastrectomy over other procedures like gastric bypass with regards to more predictable absorption of immunosuppression and reduced risk of disturbing oxalate absorption. Extrapolating data from the general bariatric surgery population, Sleeve gastrectomy provides more weight loss and less prospect of reintervention than a gastric band, with bands also having less evidence of feasibility in the post transplant setting. The following statements were therefore made. We suggest considering bariatric surgery in recipients with a BMI of 40 and over. We also suggest considering bariatric surgery in recipients with a BMI over 35 and an obesity related condition. And finally, we suggest laparoscopic sleep hysterectomy over other forms of bariatric surgery in kidney transplant recipients. That's me. Thanks for listening today.
Then uh, thank you, Dr. Gandolfini and O'Neill for this uh, excellent overview of our five PICOs and recommendation. Are there questions from the audience? You can type in your question in the question and answer button at the uh, lower part of your screen. I do not see any question up to now. So I'll, maybe I will start with the first question. Um, somehow opposing the nephrologist to the surgeon, because this is what happens in most of the program, because the nephrologists do have a patient that they feel are, is a good candidate for transplantation, but he has a BMI of 34, and the surgeon do not want to put him on the transplant waiting list. So what do you advise to do? Uh, either Dr. Gandolfini or, or two panelists, Janut Nistor or Umberto Maggiore. So opposition between nephrologist and surgeon, how to come out of that dilemma? May I maybe start answering this question? Sure. Uh, I think that uh, uh, guidelines are just uh, meant for this purpose. That, that is, uh, they do not uh, uh, represent the, a consensus of uh, the consolidated current practice, but, they, but rather they should uh, uh, try to improve clinical practice by providing uh, a balanced summary of the evidence and providing uh, uh, some recommendation based on, on the available uh, evidence. So they should be viewed as a tool uh, to make a, a decision, a decision together with the surgeon. Um, and uh, they should also view it as something that help interpreting the literature for, for, for the transplantation team. I think that uh, uh, most of uh, the um, misunderstanding concerning uh, the uh, suitability of uh, obese patients uh, comes from the fact that uh, uh, the study compares uh, usually co have compared obese with non-obese patients, and they found that obese patients uh, uh, fared worse. They had more complication, but that that is not the point. The point is the comparisons of uh, uh, between obese patients who are waitlisted or rather. Uh, 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 remain on dialysis until they uh, uh, reach the, um, the intended uh, ideal, uh, ideal weight. And this is, uh, and I think that these guidelines uh, helps uh, a lot um, in that respect. Uh, they, there is no evidence whatsoever that, that there is a benefit of keeping obese patients on di dialysis until they uh, they lose weight. All that said, uh, by no means those re recommendations uh, represent mandatory choices. Uh, in fact, uh, the grade uh, system that uh, we uh, uh, used, uh, um, um, the, um, uh, the, 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 this is the letter and the number at the end of each statement, uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, divide this the, the statement in two type of statement. Those that uh, starts with which we recommend, which is level one basically, and th those who starts uh, start with the state uh, with the statement we suggest. Uh, most of our rec recommendations start with we suggest. Most, if if not all, the only one, one recommendation concern the fact that a multidisciplinary uh, team should uh, uh, the, um, uh, supervise a, a dietary um, um, strategy for these patients. All, but apart from that, all the other uh, recommendations are level two, which means that uh, they concern the majority, like more, more than 50% of the patients, but not all the patients. It means that uh, uh, clinician uh, um, may 
find uh, that there are different patients that would require require different approaches. And if and also from the point of view of the policy maker, those are this kind of are, are, are recommendation that would suggest some sort of of um, discussion between uh, stakeholders. So these are not uh, uh, the statement should be regarded as something that does not apply to 100% of the patients. Uh, nonetheless, they summarize uh, the fact that uh, obese patients benefit from transplantation. And there is enough uh, evidence on, on, at least until uh, 40 of uh, BMI. Okay, thank you, Umberto. I would like to uh, remain on this question, asking uh, Stephen, who is a surgeon and who is knowledgeable in this issue of transplanting kidney recipient, why is there such a big heterogeneity between surgeons, some being more brave and, and willing to operate obese people, and some being much more reluctant? Is it so difficult to operate upon an obese patient, or are there other considerations in the back of the mind of the surgeons? Um, I think there's going to be a natural difference in risk appetite uh, across individuals. But uh, speaking to the previous question, having a multidisciplinary team meeting with regards listing of potential recipient candidates is very helpful in terms of harmonizing practice across your unit. Um, I think uh, from my perspective, it's not just BMI that's important. Um, certainly there are uh, very high BMI patients that you would consider transplantation for but that also takes into consideration their functional status, their comorbidities, and the patient's own individual appetite for risk. Um, so I think those, in, in answer to your question, I think there is a degree of um, heterogeneity, which you refer to, but equally, um, I think there are measures that can harmonize within a unit. How do you harmonize across units? Uh, as Inverdo's pointed out, guidelines are very helpful. Thank you. Sorry, there is one question from our audience. Is there, and that is for uh, Ilaria, is there any interaction between early stat and calcinerin inhibitors? Is it described? Is it known? Uh, actually, it is not described in the studies that we um, analyzed, but there is a potential uh, interaction between, yes, early stat and CNI. There were some case reports on cyclosporin that can lower the uh, blood levels of cyclosporin, um, altering the uh, absorption, the intestinal absorption. Thank you. Is there another question? No. So I would like to uh, come with another issue uh, we say in our guidelines, okay, uh, BMI above 35, we should uh, maybe consider bariatric surgery, but we also said, and this is our only grade one recommendation, we should start with diet. So I have a question maybe for either Yonut or Ilaria, for how long should we start with a supervised diet before we go on to bariatric surgery? Three months, six months, two years? because we do not speak about that in the guidelines. Yonu, do you have an idea or Ilaria? Yeah, I will, uh, I'll be very uh, happy to, to comment on your question, but before I do that, um, I will uh, take this opportunity to um, thank you for the invitation that you addressed to ERBP to join Descartes in this uh, collaboration. Um, it's, it's a very, I would say very difficult project. It's maybe uh, the worst case scenario for, uh, for an evidence-based team. Uh, why is that? Because you don't have RCTs, you don't have uh, uh, trials, you based your guideline only on case reports or series of cases. Most of them are observational data, retrospective. So yeah, not the best scenario to, to draw any uh, conclusion. However, we try, we try to, to summarize. Uh, although we claim that there is not much evidence, we found quite a lot of observational data. Indeed, all of them suffering are suffering from 
uh, bias of by indication. So we agree that a patient were selected for one intervention or for another. We we understand that the, there might be a confounding bias, but uh, on top of that, we we conclude that uh, patient will benefit for from intervention. What is the point to choose? diet what is the point of choosing uh, the bariatric surgery what is the point of not doing anything and just leave the patient on dialysis because that's an, also an option not to to interact with the with the bmi uh, it's indeed uh, a discussion between the surgeon nephrologist and also it, you must take into consideration the option of of the patient and uh, we we just hope that we manage to uh, add a tool to, to the discussion in this in this team. If we go back to, to your question, I would say that diet is always an option and it, it should never be uh, put off from the table uh, because we, we need to focus on diet also after we perform the bariatric surgery. Otherwise, the patient will uh, go back to the, to the initial weight. Uh, these advantages of losing weight, it can be probably uh, gained for one year, but not more than that if we don't have a dietitian and a, a structural uh, plan with, with us. So a diet is always on, on the table, uh, but, but I would consider, I would consider uh, bariatric surgery in the first year after the patient is weight listed. Okay, Ilaria, do you have something to add about the duration of yeah. diet? So as uh, you not said, so there are no data on this, like uh, in a lot of the things we, we said before. And uh, I think that the, the main point is that obese patients on dialysis are dying more than on transplantation. So since the transplant is okay performing the, the, the surgery, for me, uh, the diet and the exercise can go uh, in the in the same uh, um, in the same moment, but uh, I don't think that we have data supporting the um, prolonging the 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 time to uh, to wait list the patient uh, to wait for uh, diet and exercise to lower at maximum six kilograms for a very obese patient. I mean, it's a, a statistical difference, but it's six kilograms. So uh, in the studies uh, that we published, that we um, uh, presented before. And uh, so unless the patient is candidate to bariatric surgery because he has more than 40 of BMI or more than 35 plus other comorbidities that, um, uh, gives the patient the, um, the, the indication for bariatric surgery, apart from being on CKD, I think there is no data actually supporting. Then, of course, it's good to say to the patient, okay, uh, be, be good, like uh, not drink uh, uh, sodas and uh, uh, eat uh, properly and do exercise, but also like exercising uh, the patients, obese patients is not very easy. So like if we are doing so, then we have to provide a multidisciplinary team that is doing it properly. Otherwise it's like hiding a little bit. And... Okay, I have- Yes, another... may, maybe I also would like uh, to um, comment on this. I think that the time that we, uh, um, that the uh, um, transplant team uh, allows for uh, the patients to lose uh, weight depends on the availability of a multidisciplinary uh, weight management team at their hospital. If they have a, a plan for, uh, for uh, um, weight uh, management in obese patient, then it may be wise to wait until uh, in, in, uh, in patients with BMI above 35 or with uh, visceral obesity uh, and uh, additional com comorbidity, it may be wise to wait until this program is completed. 
Otherwise, uh, it is just, uh, as Ilaria was saying, uh, uh, abandoning the patients uh, to uh, his own uh, destiny uh, on dialysis and uh, uh, because they, they will not, most of them will uh, not lose uh, weight at all. So the time depends on what you have at your center available for the patients. And one possible, sorry, one possible um, meaning for diet is also an, for avoid malnutrition in this patient because they are obese, but they are often uh, uh, malnourished. So I think that this can go um, along with uh, all the other things that we said. Okay, thank you. Well, I see that Gabby Onisku, who is the lead author of this guideline, is with us. Thank you. Hello, Gabby. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's asking one question that I uh, launched into the audience. Maybe one of us would like to answer. Given the lack of high level evidence, what would be the perfect clinical trial between diet uh, gastrectomy, a sleeve gastrectomy before or after transplantation in this setting? What would you like to do to improve the quality of the evidence? I can try to answer. Yeah, not, good, you know, perfect. I can try to answer. Uh, it's not, not uh, an easy task, but I would consider a trial driven by center. So I would like in the DOPS, let's say. So uh, compare centers uh, between themselves and look on the centers, uh, look at the option uh, that each center uh, had, for instance, if in one center they have a multidisciplinary uh, team, compare this with a center without no, uh, no team, no uh, dietitian, or compare a center with uh, this team versus uh, a center, a dialysis center with access to, to a very good uh, surgical bariatric obesity uh, surgery center. Uh, and look on this um, difference, if there is any, uh, difference between centers, uh, as, uh, presuming, presuming that uh, in dialysis and uh, between dialysis centers, there is not much difference if they, they, they have more or less the same characteristics. So this would be a very complex clinical trial with center randomization, uh, no pharma, pharmacological support, no, no money support from the pharmaceutical company. So it's no. ideally, it would be nice to have it, but I think it's a bit utopic. Is, yes, but I think that it's a little bit surprising that there are no observational studies that simulate a randomized trial, that is simulate the patients uh, the, uh, on the way, obese patients on dialysis who are randomized to bariatric surgery uh, before weight listing or uh, uh, and, uh, weight listing straight away. This kind of, the, the, I, 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 I'm thinking about uh, an observational studies with such sort of a propensity score matching for sleeve gastrectomy that simulate this randomization during dialysis and then for, uh, follows uh, the court, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy uh, first and transplantation first court and see what are the transplantation rates and what is the patient survival. Uh, I think that uh, maybe the, the, the data may be out there and, uh, it is, uh, uh, and there is no such a study performance so, so far, to my knowledge. And, to, and in, yeah, at least we did not include any studies uh, like these in our guidelines. Thank you, Umberto. I would like to ask something to our surgeon, Stephen O'Neill. I sometimes had the impression during my career that some surgeon had a kind of judgment about obese patients that they found to be lazy, no will, no desire, no uh, will to lose weight and that there was a kind of moral judgment. And that was one of the reasons they did not want to uh, put those patients on the waiting list. And they saw that uh, losing weight was a kind of compliance test and a willingness test, a desire to be transplanted. Did, do you think this is correct that in, in the back of the mind of some surgeon, this kind of consideration do exist? 
Um, I suppose it is possible, but uh, thinking of it from a, a different angle, when you're presented with um, uh, a patient who's living with obesity and they're being put forward for assessment of transplant candidacy, I suppose what you also need to weigh up is how helpful is it going to be to send them away to lose weight? Would you preferentially take on that more difficult surgery when the patient's preemptive, they haven't had a uh, dialysis vintage and uh, their comorbidities are potentially less um, rather than, you know, casting such judgment, send them away um, with minimal chance of losing weight and they're only going to come back in a, a worse condition and at higher risk for transplant. So I, I take your point, but I think uh, when weighing up the, the benefits and risk of um, pr proceeding with transplant, I think uh, in these high BMI patients, it has to be judged in the full context of comorbidities, functional status, um, how well the patient is likely to do on dialysis um, or how well they're currently doing on dialysis. And I suppose thinking back to the um, discussion of a uh, potential trial, I think it would be interesting to, to do something in the kind of low clearance population um, and seeing what uh, uh, effect we can have whenever we're um, coming up with plans earlier for patients, um, such as when their GFR is 20 and they're initially referred, um, rather than uh, uh, you simply focusing on the, the dialysis population. Okay, thank you. Then we have another question uh, coming from uh, Gabi Anisku. Given the reluctance to transplant patients with high BMI, around 35, what other evidence do the audience think we need to get to convince the teams that they should be listed, the patient should be listed and considered for transplantation? Maybe this relates to the dissemination of the guidelines, I don't know. Who would like to comment on that? Or can we convince nephrologists and, 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 and surgeon to more rapidly, more quickly transplant those at-risk population, this neglected population? I think that the guidelines helps uh, a lot uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, and, uh, we, we of, of course, we would like to have randomized studies uh, and or maybe, as I was saying, uh, some uh, observational studies that simulate a randomized trial. Uh, uh, trial. However, uh, I think that these guidelines, as I was saying uh, before, uh, uh, helps uh, uh, people to understand that they are asking their, their self the wrong question, whether uh, obese patients uh, uh, fare worse uh, co compared to non-obese patients. Uh, with this, this kind of reasoning, then we, will, we, we should not wait least diabetic patients because diabetic patients uh, will have worse outcome than non-diabetes patients. Patients with history of myocardial infarction, the same. Patients with some mild cardiac failure, that is, would be the same. So I think that uh, uh, there is um, enough uh, evidence out there to change the mind. And then uh, you, uh, the, 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 the individual patients is, of course, is uh, something that uh, every team must uh, um, address uh, as, a, as, uh, as a single case. And also the, the team must take into cons in consideration what kind of facilities uh, uh, are available at their own hospital. But I think that these guidelines uh, are, um, should be very useful. Okay, Dr. Nistor, you have a comment? Uh, sorry, I have a question. And I, I, I think it's uh, more for Stephen. Uh, and if he, as a surgeon, and based on the current evidence and the current guideline, uh, would recommend uh, bariatric surgery uh, before or after the kidney transplant in, uh, in a patient with BMI of 35. And if he would be, it's, it's an, a hypothetical situation. If you would have a, a more experience in one technique of uh, bariatric surgery, would you choose 
the technique that you have more experience versus uh, the um, our recommendation in this in this um, in this patient yeah. i suppose as a opening disclaimer to that question um i don't perform bariatric surgery and neither do we have a bariatric surgery in northern ireland and um, so we can't actually refer our patients for bariatric surgery hence our um uh, obesity uh, case series of, of transplantation is quite authentic in that sense um, uh, in terms of complications that, that have arisen and um, potential you know, patient benefit and harm. Um, I suppose um, if someone is at that low clearance stage um, where their GFR is 20 for example and they're being referred for dialysis access assessment as well as transplant suitability I think that is potentially a very good time to refer someone for bariatric surgery. You may get some stabilization of renal function um, and correction of comorbidity, which is going to be ultimately very helpful in the longer term. Um, equally, if you have a um, patient at that stage and you think that referral for bariatric surgery is likely to delay their listing or um, lead to a delay in them receiving a preemptive living donor transplant, for example, then it's perhaps not so helpful. Um, and you may lean towards uh, bariatric surgery following transplantation. As for the techniques, um, I think it's difficult to comment as a, a non bariatric surgeon, um, but I think we've put forward some very um, reasonable arguments for considering why sleeve gastrectomy would be preferable. Um, and to my understanding, I think uh, sleeve gastrectomy is probably a lower risk procedure than a, a room Y gastric bypass, even within uh, the general uh, bariatric surgery population, let alone um, patients who are on immunosuppression. Sure. Okay. So I think uh, unless there is a very urgent need for a, for a very short comment, I think we are getting up to the end of this session. I would like to thank the ERA and uh, in particular Valentina Koki for organizing this webinar, to our panelists and speakers for their excellent intervention and talks, and to the audience for their questions. So read the guidelines, they are only 100 pages long. First and second, attend our second webinars next year with clinical case and interactive questions. So that is it, I think. Thank you very much, everybody. And then bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. <laughs>